subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from our UPSC Civil Services examination perspective. Now today let us take up some of the important news which has appeared in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 27 January 2022 and let's also take up two important articles which appeared yesterday in the newspaper dated 26 January 2022. Now these are the list of the news which we shall take up for today's discussion and time stamping for these has been provided in the description box. Now today is Thursday and as a part of our weekly answer writing practice from DNS video lectures, this is the question for the day. The question is, constitutional positions and responsibilities placed upon the office of governor is more than providing mere advice to his council of ministers. Critically examined. Now this question carries 15 marks and needs to be written within 250 words. Now before writing this particular answer, you can see the DNS dated 10th January 2022 where two important articles pertaining to the role, functions and powers of governor was discussed in detail. So this is the question for this week's DNS weekly practice question. Now let's start our today's discussion from the section of text and context. Now this news has appeared in today's newspaper dated 27th January. Now this news says the racial profiling of the Chakmas and Hejongs. When did these migrant communities arrive in Arunachal Pradesh? Where did they settle? And why does the state want to relocate the Chakmas and Hejongs? So in this news analysis you need to know about Chakmas and Hejongs. Now Chakmas are Buddhists and Hejongs are Hindus who migrated to the northeastern states of Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Tripura, etc. after they were displaced from East Pakistan from the Chittagong Hills tracts. Now the Chakmas and Hejongs who are settled as of now in Arunachal Pradesh are migrants from the Chittagong Hill tracts which was earlier in East Pakistan in the earlier 1960s. So they migrated because of this Kaptai Dam which is on the Karnafoli River. Now these Chakmas and Hejongs migrated during the 1960s and sought asylum in India and effectively were settled in the southern districts of Arunachal Pradesh in relief camps from 1964 to 1969. Now these Chakmas and Hejongs also migrated or fled East Pakistan as they faced religious persecution in East Pakistan. So that's why number of Chakmas and Hejongs can be found along the states of Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya, especially Hejongs are located in the Garo Hills and also in the state of Arunachal Pradesh. Now this particular article is with respect to a special census of 2021 which was ordered in some of the districts of Arunachal Pradesh which is mostly inhabited by Chakmas and Hejongs. And according to this November 2021 notification, this special census was to be conducted from 11 to 31st of December 2021. However, as of now, this census has been postponed after the Chakma Development Foundation of India, which is a group, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister's office. Now, this particular special census has been opposed by this particular group, namely the Chakma Development Foundation of India, as according to them, this particular special census is in violation of Article 14 and also amounts to racial profiling. Further, they have stated that it is also against Article 1 of International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Now, this international convention has been ratified by India and that's why the Chakma Development Foundation of India has been opposing this special census. Now another reason to oppose this special census which was earlier notified was because the Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh and even the Union Law Minister had talked about relocation of Chakmas and Hejongs outside the state of Arunachal Pradesh. So this instilled a fear among the Chakmas and Hejongs who are living in the state of Arunachal Pradesh that they might be driven out of the state. And also the fact that no other neighboring states such as Mizoram or Tripura are willing to accommodate them. So because of these fears of eviction by the state government of Arunachal Pradesh, 
the Chakma Development Foundation of India had written an application to the Prime Minister's office and then the Prime Minister has cancelled this special census for Chakmas and Hejongs. Now in this regard, let's understand the claims of the Chakma Development Foundation of India. Now here, according to the census of 2011, there are approx 47,471 Chakmas and Hejongs. However, according to the Chakma Development Foundation, there are approx 65,000 Chakmas and Hejongs out of which approx 60,500 are citizens by birth as per Section 31A of Citizenship Act of 1955. Now Section 31A mentions about citizenship by birth. It says that every person born in India on or after 26th January 1950 but before 1st July 1987. So based on this provision, according to the Chakma Development Foundation, approx 60,500 Chakma and Hejongs are Indian citizens by birth and the remaining 4,500 migrants, their application for citizenship has not been processed as per the citizenship rules. And here, the Supreme Court in its NHRC judgment of 1996, which was also validated in the 2015 judgment of Supreme Court, has asked the government to process these citizenship applications. Now, according to a joint statement issued by the Prime Minister of India and Bangladesh in February 1972, the government of India decided to confer citizenship to Chakmas under Section 51A of Citizenship Act of 1955, which is basically citizenship by registration. However, this move of the Union government was opposed by the state government of Arunachal Pradesh as they stated that they have the right, that is the state government has the right to ask the Chakmas to quit the state or leave the state. Thus, according to Section 51A of Citizenship Act, any person of Indian origin who is ordinarily resident in India for seven years before making an application for registration can apply for citizenship by registration. Now earlier, the All Arunachal Pradesh Students Union has threatened and also used violence on these Chakmas and Hejongs and they have also enforced an economic blockade on their refugee camps and also impacted the supply of ration, medical and other essentials. Now the APSU that is All Arunachal Pradesh Students Union were also threatening Chakmas to forcibly drive them out of the state and as stated earlier the neighboring states were not willing to accept these Chakmas and Hejongs. Now, based on these threats, the National Human Rights Commission filed a case in the Supreme Court according to which the Supreme Court directed the state government to ensure the safety and security of Chakmas and Hejongs in the state of Arunachal Pradesh and the 2015 judgment of the Supreme Court not only asked to implement the decision of Supreme Court of 1996 but also asked the Union government to grant citizenship to Chakmas of Arunachal Pradesh. Now, further, in 2000, in the case of People's Union for Civil Liberties versus Election Commission of India, the court stated that Chakmas have a right to be granted citizenship subject to the procedure being followed. Further, the court also said that it stands recognized by judicial decisions that they cannot be required to obtain any inner line permit as the Chakmas and Hejongs are settled in the state of Arunachal Pradesh. So, according to this decision, the Chakmas and Hejongs were also not subjected to the regulations of inner line permit as is applicable in the state of Arunachal Pradesh. Now earlier in 1997, even a Raj Sabha Committee on Petitions in its 105th report published the following important highlights. It said that Chakmas of Arunachal Pradesh who came to Arunachal Pradesh prior to 25th March 1971 be granted Indian citizenship. Now this date is in accordance with the date as prescribed under the Assam Accord. The committee further said that those Chakmas who have been born in India should also be considered for Indian citizenship. Now this is what have been stated by the Chakma Development Foundation of India as per Section 31A of Citizenship Act. The committee further stated that the fate of those Chakmas who came to the state of Arunachal Pradesh after 25th March 1971 be discussed and decided by the central government and state government jointly. Further, the Chakma should also be considered for granting them the status of scheduled tribes at the time of granting of citizenship and until an amicable or a peaceful solution is arrived at, 
द चकमाज आर अलाउड टू स्टे इन अरुणाचल प्रदेश विथ फुल प्रोटेक्शन सेफ्टी ऑनर एंड डिग्निटी दस द स्टेट ऑफ अरुणाचल प्रदेश एंड द यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनली मैंडेटेड टू प्रोटेक्ट द लाइफ लिबर्टी सेफ्टी ऑनर एंड डिग्निटी ऑफ चकमाज एंड हेजोंग्स एंड दे के नॉट बी फोर्सिबली ड्रिवन आउट ऑफ द स्टेट और शुड नॉट बी थ्रेटन और यूज वॉयेंस अपॉन दस बेस्ड ऑन दीज रिकमेंडेशन अलॉन्ग विद द सुप्रीम कोर्ट जजमेंट ऑफ टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन इन ट्वेंटी सेवेंटीन द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ होम अफेयर्स डिसाइडेड टू ग्रैंड सिटीजनशिप टू मोर दैन वन लैक चकमाज एंड हेजोंग्स हाउवर दिस ग्रैंडिंग ऑफ सिटीजनशिप टू चकमाज एंड हेजोंग्स विल नॉट बी अकम्पनीड बाई लैंड ओनरशिप राइट्स इन अरुणाचल प्रदेश and according to the government of india this particular decision was taken in pursuance of 2015 supreme court judgment now since the ministry of home affairs has already stated that it will grant citizenship so this special census has arisen doubts in the minds of chakma development foundation of india as they have said that it might be for the purpose of racial profiling of chakmas and hejongs in the districts of arunachal pradesh so an overall demand of chakmas and hejong community is that to implement supreme court judgment of 2015 and 1996 so that citizenship can be granted to approx 4600 odd migrants whose application for citizenship is still pending another demand of chakma and hejong community is that to extend all economic and social welfare programs of center and states further they have also demanded enrollment of names in voters list specially for their political rights and also the chakmas and hejongs community has asked for clarification from the government on citizenship amendment act of 2019 as they are not illegal migrant or refugee as per the citizenship amendment act of 2019 so these can be said to be some of the demands of chakmas and hejong community in the state of arunachal pradesh So in this news you need to know the issues pertaining to chakmas and hejongs especially with respect to the aspects of citizenship and also the important supreme court judgment of 1996 and 2015 thus this topic gets covered in your mains examination under gs paper 2 especially with respect to the aspect of citizenship under significant provisions of indian constitution important aspects of governance and also welfare schemes for the vulnerable sections of the population so after this discussion let's take up the next article The next article to be taken up appears on page number six. Now this news says unlock India's food processing potential. The news highlights that growing populations and unrestricted use of natural resources must push nations to have an efficient food value chain. Now this article highlights that with the help of food processing industry, especially for the sector of fruits and vegetables, which is produced in India, the production linked incentive scheme. can be utilized as post covid 19 the habits of indians have changed and they have become more health conscious so there is a lot of potential with respect to replacing wheat and rice which are staple food with with nutri cereals there is a lot of scope for plant based proteins which can be consumed fermented foods and even protein bars So it is in this backdrop this article emphasizes on the importance of production linked incentive scheme as it can play an important role in leveraging the food processing industry in India Now this topic of food processing and related industries in India scope and significance location upstream downstream requirements supply chain management is an important ingredient of the syllabus and gets covered under GS paper 3 So in this regard let's understand about the production linked incentive scheme about the challenges with respect to the food processing industry and also other government schemes with respect to food processing industry now regarding the important highlights of the PLI scheme or the production linked incentive scheme in the union budget of 2021-22 an outlay of roughly around rupees 2 lakh crores was announced for this particular scheme for 13 different and important key sectors and the purpose was to create a national manufacturing champions and also to generate employment opportunities so these were the two objectives for the production linked incentive scheme for these 13 key sectors and one of the 13 products under the PLI scheme was food products under the ministry of food processing industries 
So it states that the objective of this production linked incentive scheme is to make domestic manufacturing globally competitive. So in this regard, domestic manufacturing for food processing industries and also to create global champions in manufacturing. That is, these food processing industries of India can compete with the best in the world. It further says that the strategy behind the scheme is to offer companies incentives on incremental sales. So the moment the sales of those product increases, the government will provide these incentives to the companies. Further, it highlights that the scheme has been specifically designed to boost domestic manufacturing in sunrise and strategic sectors. Now, sunrise sectors are relatively new sectors which have great potential for growth. Another objective of the scheme is to curb cheaper imports, thereby reducing import bill. Basically, to reduce import by promoting domestic manufacturing of such products. Improve cost competitiveness of domestically manufactured goods. This will only be done if they are produced on a large scale and enhance domestic capacity and also exports of these products as the idea is also to create global champions in manufacturing so that we can compete with the best in the world also by exporting our processed products. So in this backdrop, we can say that the food processing industry is a sunrise sector for India as it has great potential for growth. Now the growth for food processing industry has been around 10% for the last five years as compared to growth of agriculture which is stagnated at around 3% only. Now increase in the growth of food processing industry is led by both demand side and also supply side. On the demand side the reasons are increasing nuclear families and working women. So this is also giving rise to greater consumption of these processed foods, growth of organized retail in the cities, rise in disposable incomes of people, increasing urbanization and also demand for nutraceutical foods that is fortified foods or such foods which is high in nutritious value. Now from the supply side we have mostly a favorable climate for agriculture and there are wide variety of crops which can be grown across the seasons which can be used for food processing industry like corn, potatoes etc. Further we also have a large livestock base which also helps the dairy and the meat processing sector. So the dairy and the meat processing sector is also witnessing a boom in India. And the other reason from supply side factor includes various initiatives of the government such as establishment of mega food parks, schemes such as Operation Greens, etc. So overall we can say that the food processing industry is a sunrise sector and has a lot of potential for growth. However, there are certain constraints in their overall functioning. Now one of the major concern or challenge for the food processing industry is supply chain infrastructural gaps. That is certain gaps for the food to reach from the farm to the factory for processing. And these gaps includes that of storage and also distribution. Now state APMCs or state mandis also creates a sort of a bottleneck as some of these farm produce has to be sold in the APMC market. Now another concern for this industry is lack of processable varieties. Now for example, there are only few varieties of tomatoes which can be utilized for ketchup. So the rest of the variety of tomatoes cannot be utilized for the food processing industry. Similarly for other vegetables also, this lack of processable varieties becomes a hindering challenge. Now another concern is regarding the seasonability of operations and low capacity utilization. Suppose an industry makes orange squash or orange juice. Now we know that orange is grown in only in a particular season. So the capacity utilization for orange juice for that industry reduces over a period of year and hence there is low capacity utilization especially for such processing industries which is catering to a particular product. Another challenge is regarding inadequate focus on quality and safety standards which is ensured in a factory and there is also lack of product development and innovation mostly due to lack of funds. 
so these can be said to be some of the challenges for the food processing sector or food processing industry in india now apart from the production linked incentive scheme there are other schemes also of the government of india particularly of ministry of food processing industry to address the above mentioned challenge the first of such scheme is pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana now the whole idea of this scheme is to provide modern infrastructure along with efficient supply chain management and as a part of pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana it provides for construction of mega food parks integrated cold chain and value addition infrastructure creation and expansion of food processing and preservation capacities infrastructure for agro processing clusters creation of backward and forward linkages for the supply chain food safety and quality assurance infrastructure human resources and institutions and also operation greens now one of the aspect of operation greens is integrated development of tomato onion and potato that is top value chain with the objective to enhance value realization of these farmers growing tomato onion and potato further another objective of operation green is to reduce post harvest losses price stabilization for producer and consumers and also increase in food processing capacities and value addition of such food processing and also value addition of the processed food thus the government provide for all these aspects under the pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana next let's understand about the pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises that is pmf me scheme now the scheme aims to enhance competitiveness of existing individual micro enterprises especially in the unorganized segment of the food processing industry and also to promote formalization of the food processing sector now under the scheme it provides for one district one product component and under the one district one product component of this particular scheme the ministry of food processing industries has approved more than 130 unique products as per the recommendations received by various states and union territories and these unique products of different states and uts are also provided on a gis odop digital map that is one district one product digital map so that they can be located further the digital map also has integrators for tribal scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and aspirational districts now this enables the stakeholders to make concerted efforts for its value chain development and also identification of these products now another very important aspect of this scheme is capacity building so under this capacity building component of the scheme the national institute of food technology entrepreneurship and management and the indian institute of food processing technology have been performing a key role in providing training and research support to selected enterprises groups clusters in partnership with state level technical institutions now another component of the scheme is to provide seed capital to shgs that is self help groups which is being implemented with the support of national rural livelihood mission and its network of state rural livelihood mission operating at the level of state government now in order to enhance the scheme and also the food processing industry the ministry of food processing has signed three joint letters with ministry of rural development ministry of tribal affairs and also ministry of housing and urban affairs and also the ministry of food processing industries has signed six memorandum of understandings with indian council of agricultural research national cooperative development corporation tribal cooperative marketing development federation of india that is trifid National Agricultural Cooperative Marketing Federation of India that is NAFED National Schedule Caste Finance and Development Corporation and the Rural Self Employment Training Institutes now signing of these understandings and letters overall help the growth of the food processing industry in India now overall as a conclusion we can say that food processing sector is definitely a sunrise sector and it also has the potential to reduce post harvest losses promote crop diversification and also has the potential to double farmers income and also boost employment and lastly the food processing industry also has the potential to boost domestic manufacturing within the country thereby creating competitive global champions thus this article becomes important and should be seen or read from the perspective of challenges and also potential of food processing industries in india 
So this topic has appeared in the Hindu paper dated 26th January and that is why this topic is in context of the Republic Day. This topic is a lead article in 26th January's newspaper and has appeared on page number 6. As far as the UPSC syllabus is concerned, this topic falls under the General Studies paper 2 under the section of the Constitution and Polity. The micro section includes the Indian Constitution, historical underpinnings, evolution, features, amendments and significant provisions and basic structure. Now this topic is very important as far as the concepts of the Republic, Democracy and Monarchy is concerned. And UPSC in prelims as well as mains repeatedly ask questions on the basic concepts of these terms. For example, in UPSC 2016, the UPSC asked the question, discuss each adjective attached to the word Republic in the preamble. Further, it also asks you to argue that whether these adjectives are defendable in the present circumstances or not. Now to answer this particular question, first of all, the basic information which you require is that what are the various adjectives which are attached to the word Republic in the preamble. And after that, on the second level of information, you need to be aware about the basic concepts, its relevance, its critical analysis and its association with the present circumstances. So that is why in this very regard, this article is very important from the examination's point of view. And in this article, we will study the basic concepts of three terms, that is monarchy, republic and democracy. Further, many students are in continuous confusion state that what is the basic difference between republic and democracy? Because many a times these two words are interchangeably used. So first of all, you need to understand that all these words are contextual and conceptual in nature. What we understand as the meaning of democracy today might not have been the same meaning thousands of years back. The republic which is for us today would have been very different for the people living thousands of years back. So that is why these terms are conceptual and contextual in nature and their meanings continuously evolve with the changing polity and the socio-economic structure of the society. So that is why you need not to be confused among these two terms. Nevertheless, in the present context, you need to be fully aware about these two terms. So in this very regard, first we will see that what is our preamble and what does it state. Now in this preamble, as far as the today's discussion is concerned, this paragraph is very important. It's each word has its significant meaning. So let me read this for you people. The opening lines of the preamble states that we, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic, republic. Now you all know that these two words that is socialist and secular were added later on by the constitutional amendment that is the 42nd amendment act. However, these three terms that sovereign, democratic and republic were present since the day this constitution was enforced. Now, if you closely analyze this paragraph, there is a sense of determination as well as the responsibility. The responsibility is not on the governing class. The responsibility is not on IS officers. The responsibility is on the citizens of this country. That is you and me. That is the IS officer. That is a politician, a bureaucrat, a businessman, anyone. Each and every citizen of India. That is why the preamble says that we, the people of India, solemnly resolve to constitute India into sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure all its citizens justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. Hence it means that the preamble which is the identity card of our constitution lay down a huge responsibility on yours and mine shoulder. So in this very regard, coming back to our topic, we should now discuss that what is the basic meaning of Republic. But to understand Republic, first we need to understand that what was the monarchy. When we talk about monarchy, what is it? So first of all, the concept of the monarchy, the word monarchy is derived from the word mono. And we all know that mono we mean by it is something which is single or singular in nature. 
so that is why the monarchy is the rule of one person and the other people obey to the orders of that one person so if there is a one particular person or a one particular family or clan we will call that that particular society is a monarchical society for example if we go back to the ancient india we had the system of maharajas and maharanis further this word is derived from the greek word and the greek connotation of monarchy also imbibes in itself the autocracy by autocracy we mean for example there is a party rule but there is a single party rule there is a single government the people of that particular country do not have choice that they can elect or select someone else so even the autocracy comes under the broader definition of monarchy and the biggest flaw in the monarchical system is that the people have to obey all the orders of one person now those orders might be ethical or for the good of the people and they might be against the freedom of those particular people too so that is why the problem is that the people of that particular state live on the whims and fancies of the person who is ruling them and as we all know that eventually the power corrupts the human minds so there are high chances that the power which are given to one particular ruler will be misused against the people of that particular state and the exercise of those power is highly arbitrary in nature because the problem is that the people of that particular state do not have any system or regulatory mechanism checks and balances nothing so there is no transparency in the functioning of the ruler and the ruler is neither accountable to the public so if you have understood the basic drawbacks of the monarchy so you will understand that if someone is having a typical monarchical form of government a typical monarchy is that everything is on the whims and fancy of the ruler there is not much importance given to the law not much importance is given to the constitution neither the system is followed there is no transparency there is no accountability so that is why in order to tackle these challenges and knowing that the monarchical form of government in long run will be devastating for the people the new forms of government were developed and in this continuation the next term comes the republican nature what is the republican nature of the government what exactly do we mean by republic and why is it so desirable in the modern polity so again going back to the concept of the republic the word republic is derived from two words that is res and publica this means there is something which belongs to the whole public that is the public thing and if we take this definition into the modern political context it says that decision is not limited to the narrow chambers of the king or a monarch the decision making take place in the open place there are debates discussions and deliberations right so the essence of republic is that it is participatory in nature and if you go back to the gandhian idea of swaraj which you might have studied in your modern history or somewhere else gandhi says that the people should have a swaraj now this word swaraj is made out of two words that is so in hindi which means ours that is our own thing and raj is the government so this means that the swaraj is the government which is made by us so now can you relate the idea of swaraj with the republican idea yes because republic is saying that is something which is done by public and swaraj is saying the swaraj model of government is saying that the decisions are taken by the public so the idea of swaraj is very much similar to the republic moreover if we have to compare the idea of swaraj with republic the idea of swaraj given by mahatma gandhi is much broader because the essence of the republic is limited to the political form of government it is a political concept but the idea of gandhian swaraj is not restricted to the political sphere it also has association with the personal development 
and that is why mahatma gandhi says that when i talk about swaraj it is not just against the political colonialism or imperialism but it is also against the mental colonialism which means that the ultimate aim of the swaraj is not just to overthrow the foreign rule it is also to overthrow the mental colonialism that is the ideas which are there imposed and inculcated in our mind up to such an extent that even the british had to say this that we we'll leave the race which is brown in color but which will be white in their minds and this very idea of republic and swaraj is reflected in our preamble which we just read which starts with this phrase that we the people of india that means the responsibility the duty is lying on our shoulder this is the very first word of our preamble so now the question arises that when the meaning of republic is to do something that the government is elected by the people it is participatory in nature and on the other hand when we study democracy we say that democracy is a form of government which is by the people of the people and for the people so what is the basic difference between republic and democracy because even here when you say democracy is the people's approach the people's approach means by the people for the people of the people and again in republic we have learned that republic is also participatory in nature that is by the people for the people and of the people so what is the basic difference now this difference was discussed in the constituent assembly while framing the constitution also because at that time several experts said that why should we put these two different words in the preamble because republic in a broader sense encompasses the democratic feeling in itself but after the debates and discussions all the deliberations which took place in the constituent assembly dr b r ambedkar and pandit jawaharlal nehru were finally convinced that we should keep these two words separately in the preamble now you must understand the basic reason that why these two words were in our preamble and by this you will learn that what is the basic difference between democracy and republic and why we said that we should strive to make india into a democratic republic now the difference is very simple for example in republic sense when we said that the head of the state is elected by the people now this election might be direct or indirect for example if we take the case of india here the prime minister who is the head of the government is directly elected by the people and the president who is the head of the state is indirectly elected so that is why in both the sense we are a republic but then the challenge is that when we say that the head of the state or government is to be elected by the people can we conclude that all the people are taken into account for example if in a country there are 100 people and the right to vote is given only to 50 people and these people are electing the head of the state can we call that country republic yes because the head of the state is being elected by the people but when we take the democracy the essence of democracy it means equality it means citizenship that is why we say that democratic form of government is inclusive approach when we add the word democratic before republic we make republic more inclusive because democracy asks the basic question that who is a citizen of that particular state because there were examples suppose you go back to the history of the ancient india whereby we were having republic clans so at that particular time we were having some form of government which were which was in consonance to the republican ideas but still the power was restricted in the hands of few clans the right to vote was not given to every person for example in the ancient greek history the right to vote were not given to the slaves to women so in that sense yes even those form of government were also republic in nature but they were not true democracy because the democracy is based on the pillar of citizenship on the principles of equality equity fraternity liberty and that is why we took this particular word before the republic in the preamble 
Here you can see that we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into sovereign, socialist, secular and democratic republic. So by this discussion I believe that you will so by this discussion I believe that you have understood the basic concept, the similarities, the essence as well as the slight difference between democracy and republic. Now our next topic is in relation to the low emission and its association with industrialization. This topic has again appeared in the Hindu newspaper dated 26 January on page number 7. And if you closely analyze the UPSC scheme of syllabus, you will come to know that this particular topic is the interrelation of two topics. One is the economic development and other is the environment. Because the writer in this particular article is talking about that how we can make our industrial policies more climate friendly. Because we know that presently India is in a dire need to boost its export, to boost its manufacturing and to create numerous and millions of jobs. So will it happen at the cost of the climate and environment or there are some alternatives according to which we can make our industrial policies in a sense which is targeted towards low emission growth. And that is why the micro section of this topic is related to the planning and mobilization of the resources for development. Now from the UPSC's examination point of view under this session, we will learn that what is industrial policy, what are its important key components and how we can have a green industrial policy. So first of all, the basic definition of the industrial policy is that it is aimed at economic transformation. The steps which are taken by the government and that government might be national or at the state level. That government might also be at the local level, for example, the Panchayati Raj institution or the municipalities. The only objective is that the government are taking some policy interventions for the economic transformation of a country. And by economic transformation, we mean that the overall productivity of the nation must increase. That productivity might be related to the labor productivity. That productivity might also be related to the technological productivity, the productivity in volume and the productivity in value. And for this, various policy interventions are done by the government. For example, recently you must be aware about the codification of labor laws. So now let me ask that whether the codification of labor laws come under the industrial policy, yes or no? Yes, it comes. Because any policy intervention which is targeted towards the economic transformation of a country in order to boost the productivity and to make the industries of that particular country more efficient and functional, all those interventions will be the part of the industrial policy. So that is why you need to be aware about the key components of the industrial policy. The first and the foremost thing is the research and innovation. You can imagine that if the country is weak in R&D, it will be highly dependent on the foreign countries. If there is no local research and development programs, the industrial policy of that particular country will not be Atma Nirbhar, that is self-sufficient. So that is why the research and innovation is the basic component of industrial policy. The second is trade. Because once you have developed the goods and services, obviously if you are not doing the trade, you will not generate revenue. If you are not generating the revenue, there will be no profit. So that is why the trade becomes the second important component of industrial policy. And that is why we discussed that whichever policy interventions are made, if those policy interventions are leading to economic transformations of the industry, all those interventions will be the part of industrial policy. The third important thing is energy. Can our industries run without the energy sources? That sources might be conventional in nature or that might be non-conventional in nature. Those sources might be renewable in nature or those sources might be non-renewable in nature. That doesn't matter. But the basic fact is that energy is required for any industrial policy. The next comes the regulatory ecosystem. For effective industrial policy, a country must have a better regulation system. 
which is not aimed at rent seeking or corruption but is aimed at ease of doing business and that is why presently the government of india is focusing on promoting the ease of doing business the next important thing is related to competition it is said that healthy competition is always a key important parameter of industrial policy because with the help of this healthy competition any nation will invite the investors those investors might be domestic though might be international but if there is competition only then the investors will invest in our country and if there is and if there are lot of investors only then the price of the products will fall and the quality of the products will rise so that is why competition the next important thing in the present era which is mostly governed by the information technology is digitalization the next important thing is investment which we have discussed in the context of the competition because in the absence of the investment if you are not having the money just basic knowledge if you are not having the money what will you do investments and research or development are said that these are the two foundational stones and last is the market obviously again if you have made the goods and services where will you sell it you need to have that market that market might be again domestic in nature or international in nature for example india's strength is its huge domestic market and this is one of the biggest reason that despite several economic external shocks for example asian financial crisis or other financial crisis the india's msme sector or the india's overall economy was not much affected there were many reasons for this but one of the biggest reason was that india's economy is highly dependent on its domestic market base so whenever you have to address any question in your mains or interview always keep these components of industrial policy in your mind now coming to the topic that what do we mean by green industrialization strategy and what things can the government of india take into consideration for this we all know that recently india has pledged to achieve a net zero emission target by 2070 we also know that india has pledged many things under its indcs that are nationally determined contributions so in order to project itself as a responsible stakeholder in the global fight against climate change india has targeted net zero emission by 2070 however just making the pledge and laying down the target on the papers are not sufficient there are certain steps which india must take and develop its green industrialization strategy now what are those steps the first is that india must focus on decentralized economic activity if you remember that one of the biggest challenge of the planning commission was that it was highly centralized in nature given the fact the political socio economic system which we have where we know that panchayats and municipalities play a huge role in people development it is said that india must also plan things plan industrial policy in such a way that decentralized economic activities are promoted the basic reason is that panchayats and municipalities know the required needs of those particular areas they are well aware about the local resource base they know that if they are undertaking any developmental project the brunt of its negative externalities will be borne by those local people So that is why in order to avoid all these things a decentralized economic activities must take place the next thing is as we discussed that research and development is the basic key component of any industrial policy it is said that india must invest in r&d which is climate friendly for example renewable energy if india is investing highly in let's say in solar plants in wind energy in small hydro power projects so all this r&d is climate friendly it will give us two objectives first obviously we can tackle the climate change and the other is that we will on the same time generate huge employment the next thing is related to the local innovation because when we are highly dependent on the foreign innovations on one hand we give a lot of money for that and on the other hand it is not good for our strategic interests so that is why it is said that local innovation must be encouraged 
and the last thing is that recently you must have heard that government is giving one of the highest priorities to the decarbonization of our transport we know that vehicular emissions constitute one of the greatest contributors to the greenhouse gas emissions so obviously we cannot stop the transport as a whole the only solution is that we need to make this transport decarbonized how can we do that for example promoting electric vehicles or the hybrid vehicles promoting gas that is cng based vehicles then ethanol blending in fuel so by all these steps we can decarbonize our transport sector so that is why this particular article has so that is why this particular article tries to convince that india must adopt the green industrialization strategy in order to reap the benefits of industrialization on one hand and to avoid the challenges which can come as a hindrance to the india's future growth trajectory because of the climate change our next topic has appeared in the hindu newspaper dated 27th january This topic is from the environment and ecology section and is mainly relevant from the prelims examinations point of view. This topic is in context that recently in the state of Andhra Pradesh the spot bile pelicans have been dying in a large numbers because of a disease outbreak. Now from the UPSC scheme of syllabus point of view this topic falls under the micro section of the preliminary examination under the environment or ecology biodiversity part. So that is why we need to be aware about the key facts related to this particular news. The first important thing is that why there have been a mass mortality of this species. The cause of the mortality has been told as a nematode infestation. Now nematode is basically a parasite and this parasite was transferred to these pelicans when they were feeding upon the fishes. it is known that pelicans are majorly found in the wetlands so while feeding upon the fishes these parasites were transferred which led to the disease outbreak and there were a large scale mortality however the researches are still under progress now in this context we need to be aware about the iucn status of this particular species and the other dimensions which can be asked in the prelims examination so the according to the iucn red list of threatened species these species are nearly threatened that means that these species are not critically endangered or endangered but still the issue is that the population of these species are declining if we have to look at the geographic range of these species they are mostly found in these countries here you can see this picture these species are mostly found in the state of india sri lanka cambodia and potentially in thailand also So the point is that these species are found in the South Asia as well as South East Asia. Further, the natural habitat and ecology of these species are deep and shallow wetlands and these wetlands can be both that is man-made and natural. Further, these species have high flexibility as they are found in freshwater ecosystems as well as the saline water ecosystems. Moreover these species are also found in the open and forested areas Now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day the question is consider the following statements First chakmas and hedgehogs were displaced from Chittagong hill tracts in the 1960s and since then have migrated and settled in north eastern states of India Second state of Arunachal Pradesh has ordered special census for chakmas and hedgehogs as the central government did not include them in the census of 2011 So the question is which of the statements given above is are correct options are a one only b two only c both one and two and d neither one nor two Now coming to the answer of 25th January 2022 the question was which among the following is necessarily associated with counter cyclical fiscal policy options were attempt to reverse the business cycles second increase in government's expenditure and third decrease in tax rate Now the counter cyclical fiscal policy basically attempts to reverse the business cycle and this is adopted to counter both recession and inflation and based on this understanding option 2 and option 3 becomes incorrect so here the correct answer was a that is one only so with this we come to an end to today's discussion thank you for watching dns